All right. Um, welcome, uh, everyone. It's good to be here with you today. So hopefully we can uh, pass on some information about giant rat's tail grass, uh, its uh, ecology, biology, and management that will assist you uh, with uh, managing perhaps your patch or uh, advising or advising others. So let's see how we go. So basically, giant rat's tail grass consists of uh, two species, Sporobolus pyramidalis and Sporobolus natalensis. And in reality, they're probably not all that different to manage. They look very similar out in the field. And if you can see that through the middle of that picture or that screen there, uh, that's a, some giant rat's tail grass growing in front of a, a woodland in uh, North Queensland. Um, and I just want to run through a few facts about giant rat's tail grass. So it is a significant weed in Queensland, uh, even into northern New South Wales. Um, for the grazing industry, uh, dairy industry, wider environment, the wider environment, and it costs us millions of dollars uh, in lost production and control costs on an annual basis. Um, and hopefully, understanding some basic characteristics about these species will assist management. So, um, using this information helps us develop strategies as part of normal. Uh, property management, and it also helps us uh, support weed pasture and, and business management goals, and uh, and also assists us meeting any biosecurity obligations that we have. Um, and also, when we look at it and we start minimising the risk of spread and protecting clean areas, uh, we can reduce future weed control costs and produ production losses. Um, Protecting clean areas, if possible, is actually one of the most cost-effective ways of managing weeds. So if you've got an area that's clean, uh, the best thing to do is to try and keep it clean uh, in the future. So if we move on to the next slide, you can see all the red dots down the eastern seaboard of Queensland. And I think they just jump over into northern New South Wales or that so you can see there's a very big concentration of giant rat's tail grass specimens um, being collected um, from Cape York right down to the border. A few specimens out, say, around the Ralston area in central Queensland um, and a bit north. And then if you go up to near Townsville, um, you've got those uh, dots jutting out into northern Queensland. And uh, so that's um, just east of the Great Dividing Range or just on top of it. And so it's in a really precarious position in terms of it could move west uh, and then uh, you'd get more dots up around the Gulf country um, and so on. But giant rats tail grass is moving and expanding its range. And by all means, that all those dots there don't represent exactly where it is in terms of they represent where people have collected a specimen and sent it into a herbarium uh, and that's uh, where those locations are. So it's a, got a very wide geographic distribution. Things that are important to note, um, graziers are reporting 10 to 80% losses in carrying capacity depending on its density of infestation. So very low infestations, you probably won't notice it too much, but where you get to 50% of the pasture or more, your losses are gonna be quite significant. Um, principally due to livestock don't eat it that much, it's not that digestible, and it takes up space, so you don't have your preferred pasture species there. Here's another picture um, as we move down. This is a nice green patch of giant rat's tail grass and uh, immature, but uh, developing quickly after some rain. So it can look nice and green, um, but even at that stage, it's not particularly uh, useful for grazing. Um, it's still quite unpalatable um, and has low digestibility compared to say, your more preferred species. Now, the, one of the big questions asked is how do I identify it? 
stock identification is difficult. If you look on the left of that screen, you'll see a seed head um, that is probably the very typical uh, seed head that you would see. But one of the problems is, is we have a lot of variation around the structure and uh, shape of the seed heads. So sometimes the branches will be shorter, they'll be all pressed into the central stem. Um, they just won't look the same. Um, some will be immature or affected by soil fertility or um, whether they've been slashed. It just changes how they look. And we do have some native species that can look quite similar. So I'm not, I can't really get into a big identification uh, description today. All I can say is that we need to get our mind around what we're looking at, and that'll take probably some professional help through uh, either your local government, your DAF officers, your biosecurity officers, uh, or the Queensland Herbarium. Um, having said that, um, it is very difficult to get very precise identifications uh, and there's some continuing work on improving how we might be able to identify and get better identification. So here's another um, seed head and that's really what they look like. That's the atypical or your very typical rather giant rat's tail grass seed head, quite long, can be up to 50 centimetres long, nice loose branches but they can be much more close to the central stem um, and uh, often leaning when they're leaning those branches will come away from the stem and in the name when you talk about pyramidalis the stem when it's standing upright will have a slightly uh, pyram pyramid shape just because the branches are longer at the bottom and they sit out a bit more but there's a lot of variation and really um, it's a learning process to get to know what you're looking at. I just want to um, also talk about one of the identification issues. If you can look at this seed structure here, um, and you'll notice the seed, you'll notice the lemma and paleia, but one of the, um, there's two structures down the bottom called the lower gloom and upper gloom, and they are one of the key things for pulling some of the species apart. So they are little structures that help support the seed. They can be long, they can be half or longer than the seed head, they can be short, they can be uh, very pointy, or they can be rather um, rough edged and flat. What we have with giant rat's tail grass that does make a lot of that identification rather difficult is, is a lot of variation in those. So if we might say this is what a giant rat's tail grass should typically look like with those glooms being very short compared to the length of the seed. Uh, even on the same seed head, sometimes you can get a lot of variation in those and even between seed heads in the same paddock or on plants adjacent to each other, you can get a lot of um, variation in those and that really makes the seed heads difficult. To see these glooms, you actually need a, a hand lens, so a, say a by 10 magnification or a microscope to have a really good look at them. And so in-field identification, unless you've had some identification done before, can be quite challenging. And that's where we need to seek some professional help in doing that. So some more characteristics about giant rat's tail grass. It has very large seed banks. Um, Produces a lot of seed, so some measured seed production per metre squared in dense giant rat's tail grass is 85,000 seeds in a year, which is quite high. So in one seed head or inflorescence, that can be 200 to 500 seeds. It's interesting, it will seed and, and you can get seedlings at any time of year, given adequate soil moisture and suitable temperatures. So, and of all that seed falling off, so of that 85,000 seeds per square metre, 90% are viable. So it's very high seed loads in dense giant rat's tail grass. And here's a picture of some seed. Uh, you can see tiny little seeds, 0.3 microns to one millimetre long. 
So uh, if you're cleaning this, you need a 0.3 micron sieve. Uh, sorry, a, a 300 micron sieve. So to clean seed out of um, the chaff. Um, one of the interesting characters about this seed, it doesn't actually have a mechanism for moving. Pretty much it'll all fall on the ground. The wind doesn't move it that much. Uh, water could shift it if it's stuck to a seed head or stuck to something else. One of the interesting things when it's moist, it's got a sticky mucilage around the seed, so it will stick to lots of things. And in my experience, I've seen um, several uh, instances of where mustering livestock through rat style grass on a early morning in the dew and the belly of the cattle are reddish colour from all of the seed as with the dog, the cattle dog and the horse or quad bike or motorbike or whatever you're using. So it's a very, very good uh, seed in terms of being able to move around. Um, that sticky mucilage allows things like wallabies and kangaroos and pigs and any other animal moving through it to move it around. And that seed will stay there until it's either knocked off or some other moisture comes and loosens it and it falls off. So it can move a long way in, um, because it just sticks to things when it's moist. So some other characteristics, um, some of the seed longevity. So the seed longevity is how long it lasts in the soil. Um, some measured work done at Gainer. So if you follow the blue line, is nearly up to 10 years, and which is a long time. And it, that just says that if we start looking at managing this, we've got a, a long period to actually do it. It's not something we can jump into and out of because if we stop after two years, it won't be long before that there'll be more seed input and then you start back at time zero to run that seed bank down. The red line is interesting and it does show that you can reduce the seed bank quite quickly um, in a two or three year period through just cultivating soil. So there may well be options to do some cultivation, to do something else for a number of years and then move back into a suitable pasture um, species after that. So it needs to be considered. Um, but having said that, you still have to control the seed that the seedling germination and establishment during that two year period. So that can be a bit challenging as well. This table could look a little bit confusing, but basically if you look on the left, we're looking at gap size in the pasture. So that's say 15 by 15 is 15 centimetres by 15 centimetres. And what was done here by a colleague, Stephen Bray, was he planted 50 seeds in these gaps or where there was no gap and, and gaps. And then he looked at um, how long it took the plants to mature and how many inflorescence or seed heads it produced in the following 11 months. And so it's interesting as the gaps increase, you certainly get uh, shorter periods for seed head development. So even up to a 30 by 30 centimetre gap after 11 months, there actually was no seed heads. But if you keep increasing that, um, you can get a number of them. And where there's no gap, there's no plants on the right hand side. And where the gaps are small, you've got uh, no seed heads after that period and as the gap increases. And this is, I think, pretty well known. So there's more gaps in pastures, other things will colonise. And what it says in terms of management is that uh, pasture management or vegetation management to maintain uh, as much cover as possible will actually assist in your giant rat style grass management and will assist in terms of slowing plant development down, reducing seed production, and uh, just overall helping you to maintain giant rat's tail grass at a, at a manageable level. And moving on, this is a, a big question when we start looking at cattle because uh, most of the giant rat's tail grass is in cattle areas, uh, either through dairy cattle or beef cattle. And so how long does a seed start to move through or take to move through cattle. And we're looking at seven to eight days to move through cattle. 
which is a significant period. Um, so if I'm moving livestock around my property and they're going through a giant rat star grass area, uh, they'll be um, passing seed for seven days if I move them out of that area. And that is uh, um, something to be considered in terms of trying to maintain areas free of giant rat star grass uh, rather than infesting more areas with giant rat star grass. So something to consider for how we move livestock around, how we graze, when we shift them off property to another property and so on. It takes a week to, to empty an animal out. Uh, and uh, so moving on, so we might ask then how many seeds are viable? Well, about 20% remain viable uh, once they're passed through an animal. Um, the, uh, Andrews here did some more work where he looked at giant parramatta grass, which is um, a, a close relative of giant rat cell grass. And he estimated that in heavy infestations, heifers were ingesting about 8,300 seeds per day. And of those, 20% remained viable, which is about 1,600 every day remained viable. And in light infestations, that dropped down to 2,200. But even 20% 20 of 2,200 is 500 or uh, 400 or so seeds. And uh, as you're moving them into new areas without rat star grass, that can be very uh, significant in terms of infesting uh, what we might call clean areas. It's interesting also with giant rat star grass, we talk about, I talked about the seed and how it moves around. And um, one of the questions asked early on in, in the research that I've done is how far does the seed move from a plant? And so I, I did some testing and really if you've got um, 1.8 metre high rat style plants, about three metres is the limit. Yeah, you can see uh, on that graph there. And what that says is that if I want to actually try and keep a plant in a, in a place uh, and rather than moving seed around, I could actually do that by putting a buffer in like this and keeping that buffer clean and that will assist keeping giant rat style grass in one spot. Um, of course, creeks and river systems and drainage lines are always a challenge, but um, overall some buffers has proved to be quite successful in helping to limit the spread of giant rat style grass. It, it can also um, assist with uh, between neighbours. So if one uh, property is relatively clean of rat star grass and the other one has a lot more, putting in a buffer strip can actually diffuse um, or assist with the relationship between those two neighbours um, and just help manage the, the spread of giant rat star grass. So we would recommend about a 10 metre, so give you a little bit more of a buffer uh, buffer strip, so a 10 metre wide buffer strip to as a begin, beginning uh, to assist with uh, trying to just keep GRT in one spot and keeping some clean areas clean. A lot of questions around how fire uh, and what fire does to giant rastar grass. Um, giant rastar grass burns extremely well. You can consume some of the surface, so the soil seed bank up to 50% reduction. But if you've got 80,000 seeds or even 10,000 seeds sitting in the soil, a 50% reduction still leaves 5,000. So we'd, I'd be suggesting that we don't use fire unless we've got some other thing we're gonna do afterwards like controlling the regrowth um, and killing plants. The other thing that fire does is it uh, stimulates giant rastile grass to produce an enormous seed crop. And uh, the plants normally after a fire with, uh, are big and robust and um, it looks like someone planted a crop in dense areas. So you've got to be careful using fire. Um, it's best to use fire in conjunction with something else. So fire can be used as a, as a pre-treatment to establishing pasture. Um, it can be used where all I have is giant rat style grass and I want to 
make some use out of it so my livestock can actually uh, eat some green green pick. So that fresh green pick of giant rat star grass is quite okay. It's just when it gets a bit more mature and rank that uh, is a problem. The other thing with fire is, is the, the big plants and also seedlings are really quite mature, uh, quite tolerant of fire. So if you look at the picture with these two plants in the pot here, on the left you can see what was burnt and on the right you can see what was left. And that was burnt uh, in about 4,000 kilo, kilograms per hectare of dry matter, which is a fair bit, uh, and will produce a very good fire and a quite hot, a hot fire. So this seedling here, which is only about 15 centimetres tall, was able to survive that fire. Um, and so we just need to be careful and when we start thinking about fire that we have a very good plan about how we're going to manage it and manage what happens after because if we don't actually do anything apart from um, burn it we actually will probably just make the problem worse and we'll have more GRT so uh, something to consider herbicides I just want to run quickly through some herbicides here Really, we've got two main herbicides, one called flupropanate, which is marketed as task force or tussock, and there are other trade names out there or a granular product. I'll talk about glyphosate in a minute. So at the registered application rates, it's um, selective. Just got to be a little bit careful because a little bit of overdosing can cause big problems and you can moonscape uh, land pretty easily. Um, so flupropanate is both a root and foliar uptake. About 10% or 20% can be uptake through green foliage, but the majority is activated uh, through the root zone and you need some rainfall to get it to the root zone and the plant needs to grow then to uptake that herbicide. Um, you can apply it as a spot, a broad acre or an aerial treatment and can be applied to sort of growing plants or hayed off plants. It just need to realise that if you apply it once it's dry and the plants are hayed off, you won't get a lot of activity then until you get some rain and the plants can uptake the herbicide from the soil. Um, flupropanate will last there quite happily sitting on a plant for a number of a period. But um, one of the issues is if you put it out on some dry stuff and you get a fire, uh, it will disappear. It will be consumed by the fire and it is quite costly. So you've uh, really wasted that money then. It's slow acting, can take three to four months to kill plants. Um, from field observation, seed is still produced while the plants die and a portion of that seed is viable. Um, residual activity can be variable, 6 to 12 months based on field observations. And so withholding periods are really important. So if I'm spot spraying, 14 days. If it's broad acre, it's four months. And livestock off treated pastures need to be sort of spelled for 14 days on clean feed prior to slaughter. So it does vary a little bit. So the labels of task force and tussock are actually a little bit different. So it really ensures that you read your label and get some good advice before you use flupropanate. And we probably know glyphosate or Roundup a lot, lot better. So it's non-selective, foliar uptake. You can apply it as spot, broad acre or aerial, but it kills everything. So via a boom spray, a boomless jet or a wick wiper. And plants need to be actively growing or you're not going to really kill them. Um, field observation, so if you've got some seed but semi-mature on a plant, uh, when you treat it, those seeds will most likely still be viable. It's got no residual activity and withholding periods aren't really significant. It's more about uh, leave, not grazing it to um, let the herbicide do its job on the plant without uh, having an animal consume it. I just want to show you um, what happens with seed viability and glyphosate. So if you look down the left hand column, you've got days from anther appearance. So anther is where the pollen is, those little 
um, creamy or sometimes purple things that sit on the seed head. So once they appear, um, you don't have a long time until you start getting some seed that will remain viable. So if you look at the viability of the not treated column, um, if I was to uh, pull those seeds off the plant four days after the anthers there, 5% will be viable, but it doesn't take long until that's 50, 60 and 95%. If I'm spraying them, I've got really eight days and I've got 23% stay viable. And then after 12 days, 40%, and after 16 days, 86%. So once seeds, and this is a broad general statement, once seeds are past a, a maturity point, treating them with the herbicides doesn't actually do a lot. They will still mature and largely be viable. And that can be a loss across a whole lot of species of plants. So um, just be careful and just, you need to know this so when you're out spraying with your with your glyphosate i may be stopping some seed production but there will likely be some still uh, seeds viable uh, following treatment so i just want to talk a little bit about management now um, and i don't want this to seem like management 101 but very very clear objectives with giant rat star grass and why i say that is if we don't have clear objectives um, giant rasta grass uh, has a potential to bite you if you if you waver off your objectives or you sort of give up partway through a treatment program. It will come back with a vengeance and all the money and time and effort you've put in will essentially be wasted. So it's important that we have a clear objective and know exactly what we're going to do and be able to sort of modify that a little bit as time goes on. Um, to achieve a result. And the management and control of giant rat star grass is probably not about eradication. It's about minimising impact and maintaining productivity or environmental values. So I say that in terms of uh, eradication of giant rat star grass once it gets to a relatively high level um, is probably more an aspirational goal and it's going to take a long time to get to that point. So what I would suggest is that management is about uh, enabling um, a, a beef enterprise or an enterprise to uh, maintain productivity. Um, so you don't have to sell your property, you can still get an income, you can still live there, all those things, rather than about trying to um, go in holus bolus and eradicate it. So early detection and intervention is critical. So getting a handle on the identification and seeing it and then don't leave plants there. You've got to act on them straight away. Herbicides in isolation are generally not the answer. Now I would say that in terms of on a broad scale basis, if you've got two plants on the side of the road and you nuke that area and you know where it is and you come back and you keep nuking it until there's no new seedlings, that's fine. But on a large scale, on a large area, herbicides are not the answer. And so in long-term management, it's going to require some pasture management. It might see you change the way your business works. You might have to think about changing all sorts of things uh, to, to still remain productive. It, you might have to include fertilizer on your sown pastures so they're really competitive. Um, and the things you need to say, there's not really a quick fix with grass. It's not like, um, I mean, I would have a paddock of Parthenium any day compared to giant rat style grass. And the last comment is eradication. It's a big question mark and we might move towards eradication over a number of years, but it's gonna take time and if we can maintain our production or the values of the land that we need to have there, I think that's even a win on its own. I think I'm nearly nearly through the slides now. So I just want to, you know, farm by security, we might talk about that on the boundary fence, but we need to talk about it internally as well. So we need to understand how the seed moves and I've talked a lot about cattle. What about vehicles, including cattle trucks? water, feral animals, 
and we could put in some processes to stop or limit that seed movement because that's how it it doesn't grow by a uh, part of a plant being shifted. It's all about the seed. And it might mean we're going to spell cattle as we move them around the property, um, create a holding area that we move cattle through when we move them so that we can treat that area and not and, and limit the risk of spread of seed throughout the whole property. It might involve changing the way we fence the property. Um, you know, a small portion of a property that's got dense GRT in it, you know, maybe it's about putting a fence around it and going, nothing goes in, nothing goes out, but I'm going to treat it in there and leave it there. So sometimes some quite, what we've got more drastic action uh, is necessary with giant rat style grass, simply because if, if we don't manage it or we don't make some changes or we can't get on top of it, uh, it will get on top of you and cause big problems. So just a little bit about that and just to leave you with a picture of um, what some bad giant rat style grass can look like if you have not seen it. So this is about 90 to 95% giant rat style grass and um, hopefully some of the information will either be able to move you back from 95% if that's the case you're in or um, stop you getting to 95% and maintain some productivity uh, on your land your, or in your national park or wherever uh, you come in contact with giant rat's tail grass.